Praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah for Jesus. Glory to the holy name of the Lord God Almighty. Oh, glory, 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 glory. Somebody say glory. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Hallelujah. We're talking about Jesus today. Amen. As we always do. We're in Jeremiah chapter 40. We're going to cover 40 through 45 today. And I've taken a title that the Lord said himself. He said, all shall know whose word shall stand. And so today, I'm wondering how many will really understand as we go through this. As we look at uh, these five chapters, uh, actually six, I guess, when you look at them all together. But anyway, when you look at this passage in God's word and you think about the conditions that the people were in, the attitude that they had towards the word of God, towards God, but about his word is really different. The attitude towards their position in the Lord, I should say. This, this, is, this is something that we pray constantly would the message would be conveyed to the heart of everybody that hears the word of God. It's the attitude of the heart towards the relationship with God sometimes can be far different than the attitude towards the word itself. Meaning, to, to clarify that, to make that statement hit home for anybody that's listening today to this message, all shall know whose word shall stand, is that many people believe in God, but they don't really care much about seeking God in his word or doing his word. They have faith, they have faith to believe in God, and they have faith in to believe to believe in their salvation, but they really don't understand it because they don't really know the Word of God and how the Word of God consistently reveals himself in, in his word from beginning to end. And as he unfolds the mysteries of the Old Testament and the New Testament and how it all works together and how much it is needful. Most people don't really know how needful it is for us to be into the Word or to be knowledgeable of the Word or to seek the Word. They really don't. They have faith and they believe in God, but they don't really get the message because for one thing, they've been taught only to believe with the mind and they equate that with the heart. And I'm not saying they don't believe from the heart, but without understanding, how are they going to really know what they're believing. If they're only getting part of a message and a very basic part, of course, in no way is the basic part any less important than the rest. But the fullness of the message, the entirety of God's word, remember what Jesus said? He said, this in the Old Testament, and he said it in the New Testament. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word 
that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And he said things like, when they, he was confronted that his family was trying to reach him when he was involved in serious teaching to multitudes of people, but his family showed up and they wanted to see him, but they couldn't get to him because of all the people around him. He said, who's my mother and brother and sister? Then he points to those in front of him and said, these are those my mother, brother, and sister, those that hear the word of God and do it. So that, that message really doesn't seem to hit home how important that is. You can't really do it if you don't know what to do. And the emphasis on do, Jesus put the emphasis on do. He said they believe and they do. But we're taught by many false teachers that we don't have to do anything but believe. But that isn't what Jesus said. He said, my family are those that hear the word and do it. And then others will feel very convicted about this or convinced that they should do the word so they they try to follow it according to the dictates in the letter only because they don't understand the spiritual application of the word of God or what's going on. So we're going to look at this today. This, this is at a time to, to bring us into the setting at the time. This is at the time when Judah had finally come to the end of their sovereignty, the nation of Judah, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried them off to Babylon as directed and planned and really facilitated through King Nebuchadnezzar. Judgment on the people of Judah and Jerusalem because of their disobedience. And so when you're looking for an application, it's certainly obvious what the application is. That God is looking for people that will follow him according to his word in the spirit and life of it. It's a part of your life. It is your life, not a part of it. It is, is your life. Man doesn't live by bread alone. We're talking about man that followed Jesus. He lives by every word. He lives by faith, yes. But he lives it. It's not just believing in it. He lives it. And then, <clears throat> as the title gives us the... the uh, might say the beginning of, uh, let me not say beginning, but it's, it looks, it's, it is contrasting really. Uh, those who believe God's word and those who do not believe God's word. They believe in God, but they don't believe his word. I've known a lot of people that over, like that over the years. They believe in God, but they know nothing about the word and they don't believe the word because the word talks about judgment. The word talks about being responsible and the things that we should do and that we need to do if we're going to be counted with those that Christ returns for, meaning his spotless bride at the time of the rapture. Many people don't believe in the rapture. They believe in God, but they don't believe in the rapture. The word talks about the kingdom. That's one that is really distorted. Many people believe we're living in the kingdom right now. In a sense we are, it's a kingdom of God, but it is the kingdom of God over the kingdom of the devil. The devil is in between, he's in the way. 
and he is making a mess of this world and God is allowing it because people don't understand this is the wilderness you go through after you get delivered. This is the time of testing to see if you're going to persevere to get to that promised land. This is the word of the living God from beginning to end. He delivers us and then allows us the choice of how we're going to live. He doesn't just write his word in our heart without our permission. And he doesn't write it in our heart unless we make it a part of our heart. These are critical points that needs to be conveyed and stressed and, and constantly spoken in the gospel that people will understand the truth. Many people believe that if you come to Christ, everything's going to work out. Well, yes, it will at the end time, but not until then, because... The life with Christ is a life of sacrifice. It's not making a lot of money and going on vacations and having a gay time. This is not the gospel. The gospel is the life of sacrifice and suffering for the cause of Christ. A life that is committed to Christ, a life that is given to Christ for the purpose of Christ, which is spreading his word that all may have the opportunity. But many people are lulled to sleep because they, they, they hear the good word and, and the good news of the gospel about salvation, but they know nothing about the requirement of the walk as a, a the family member of God to do the word from the heart, to live it. You don't have to. It's not grievous to the people who love the word. It's not grievous to walk in the word when you love it. I should say with emphasis meaning Jesus. You have to love Jesus. You have to understand Jesus. You have to, it just must start with that love affair. Not simply believing only. Of course, believing is necessary. But it's not the full answer. Receiving Christ is necessary. But walking in him is also just as necessary for the desired end result, which is the salvation of our souls, which will be revealed, scripture says, at the revelation of Jesus Christ in the end time. Praise the Lord. With that understanding, people fall in love with Jesus, fall in love with the word. You get into the word, it'll get into you. That's the truth. That's the power of the truth. That's where the love affair really brings the fruit that God wants and manifests in that family, that remnant, that faithful group of people I pray that every one of you and us are included in that remnant, that faithful group, that group that perseveres, that group that stands the gap, that, that, that group that those people that hold fast to the profession of their faith without wavering, meaning their vocation, walk worthy of the vocation wherein they were called, which is a life of service, complete submission to the one who died for us. As we do that, 
we will live forever with him. Praise God. That's his word. So another really serious point here is that people will think that the word of God is, is not really. Let's use an example. Let's say the rapture. People don't think that's going to happen. People in church. Or if they believe it's going to happen, they don't think it's going to happen right away. When Christ says, you know not the time, the day, or the hour. It's going to come as a thief in the night. It, it, which means unawares. And that is the purpose of God, that we would know that we must be found at that time without spot or wrinkle, that we may enter into that rest that he has prepared for us for eternity and walking with him. So all shall know whose word shall stand. The, the people of Judah were put to that test because not only the ones that went into Babylon because of their disobedience, but the few poor people that were left behind, that Nebuchadnezzar left behind and left a, a, a righteous ruler over them, not, not a king or anything like that, but just a kind of a governor, as someone who could care for them and guide them. They were the poor people who left so they could Till the land, the scripture says. But when they heard, when the rest of the, the countries around heard that the Lord had done that and all the people of Judah were in Babylon in bondage, they started to return to Judah and Jerusalem. And then things changed as far as the attitude of the people and the purpose that they were coming back home for. So let's get into it here. Starting with Isaiah 40, verse 8, says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. The word of God is indestructible and it certainly is eternal and God has preserved it for us. It's not lost. God's word is here today. We're speaking it. So let's get into it and believe it. Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The scripture references are there for you. Right there underneath that statement, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, Jesus said, shall not pass away. You can't destroy God's word. And it will perform that which he said it to do. So I've put together these chapters 40 through 45 in what is called a table of events because it's it's important to sum it up and bring out the real message that it's saying so we'll go through the, uh, the what actually happened with Jeremiah at that time that Judah was taken to Babylon. Jeremiah was left. Jeremiah is the only one of those people that were active in Judah's existence other than those few poor, poor people. Jeremiah didn't have to go to Babylon. And it's amazing because he was, he was prophesying like 40 years before about this, this judgment of going to Babylon unless people came back to God. But right here in, in chapter 40, the first one, Jeremiah is delivered from that 
God delivered him from prison, actual prison there. At the time Nebuchadnezzar came, Jeremiah was under, under uh, he was incarcerated by King Zedekiah. But he was set free and not only set free from that prison, but King Nebuchadnezzar told his captain of the guard to treat Jeremiah favorably and allow him to choose what he wanted to do. Did he want to go back and be with those poor people? Or did he want to go to Babylon with the rest of the people? And whichever one he chose to do, they would deal uh, kindly with him. He was not really in bondage. He was before the judgment court of Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar said, if he wants to go free, let him go free. If he wants to come with us, we'll treat him uh, nicely. Jeremiah chose to go with the people that were in the land. But this is a shadow and a type of the deliverance that God offers to each and every one of us as a type of the rapture. The rest of the people go into the, into the time of the tribulation, but the rapture of the church, meaning the remnant of the church, the true believers are delivered, they're set free by going to be with the Lord forevermore in the rapture. That's a type. And chapter 41, Gedaliah is the governor that Nebuchadnezzar placed over those people that were left in, in uh, Judea. Uh, over the remaining poor Jews. And the Jews and other nations, like I told you, they returned to Judah because they hear that Judah is, is uh, now vacated by the Babylonians and they have some people there. And not only were the Jewish people coming, but Gentiles come also. And what happens in chapter 41 is that right away, there was rivalry, rivalry in Judah because they they weren't coming for the right reason to come back to their land and and live peaceably. They wanted to, they're corrupt. They were wicked. And so they started to corrupt uh, the nation there and destroyed Gedaliah. They, they slew Gedaliah, the governor that Nebuchadnezzar had placed over them in direct violation of the king of Babylon, uh, allowing those people to live a, a free and, and uh, prosperous life there in the land. Chapter 42, that because uh, they realized that they had killed Gedaliah, the chosen vessel of Nebuchadnezzar, the king, they would start to be afraid. And so they asked Jeremiah to, to seek God for them what they should do. And they said, whatever God says, we will do it. So God answers when Jeremiah seeks the Lord and he says, stay in Judah and live or go to Egypt and die by the sword, the famine and the pestilence. I should have told you that they they thought that the, if they stayed in Judah under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, actually, that they would be in trouble and in bondage. So they wanted to go to Egypt where they thought they could be free. They wanted uh, Jeremiah to ask the Lord what to do. And they said, whatever he says, we will do it. So look what he says. Stay in Judah and live or go to Egypt and die by the sword, the famine, or the pestilence. 
Now, this is saying a mouthful right here because here's Jeremiah, used of the Lord yet again and still being faithful to bring forth the full gospel, the full truth. Jeremiah didn't back up one portion of an inch. He didn't hedge at all on the message of God. He said, if you want to live, you stay in Judah. If you want to leave Judah and go to Egypt, which is a type of the world, then you're going to die with these sword, famine, and pestilence. Chapter 43, the Jews decided not to believe Jeremiah, call him a false prophet, and said they're going to go to Egypt anyway. Jeremiah prophesies that not Nebuchadnezzar will overtake and destroy them if they do. And not only them, but the Egyptian gods also in Egypt. God requires us to follow his word. If we want to receive the blessings that he promises, we must meet the condition that's not taught. It's a false doctrine today of a despicable, evil, wicked doctrine that says all you have to do is believe and you'll be saved. It's a damning message. It's not a deliverance message. Do you see how this word of God is replete with this message? It says it from beginning to end. He gives us a savior, but we must walk with him. Those that walk with him are the ones like Enoch. He walked with God and God took him. Like Noah, who he and his family were the only ones saved and the rest of the world were destroyed. Another type of the rapture and the tribulation. It's, it's from the very beginning that God does it. He's doing it right here in this setting of the people there of Judah who are taken into bondage. Their promised deliverance after 70 years, that's what God promises here. But there's coming a time when that won't be offered in the, in the gospel. And it's today. This is only a type that shows us a partial fulfillment of the judgment. Remember, God is continually manifesting and exhibiting loving kindness righteousness and judgment in the earth and he delights in these things continually he delights in 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 the mercy and the righteousness and the judgment he's doing that right now he's done it from the beginning he will do it forever because he's a righteous god there is no darkness in him and if people don't want to follow him in his word they will suffer the consequences that's judgment if they fall in love with him and walk with him they will be delivered and he will walk with them throughout this earth through every skirmish every temptation every testing and every trial through torture and everything, he will walk with us through this life as we submit to him, as we are called to live the life of Christ, the life that Christ lived, completely submissive to the Father, even to the death of the cross. And because of that, 
His name is above all names. Praise God forever. Chapter 44. I'm going to read that. In this chapter, the Jews just defy God's word. Uh, and they say, actually, they're going to follow their own way. They're completely rebellious. And God answers and says, all shall know whose word shall stand and mine or theirs. They think they're going to get delivered because they're going to worship the, the queen of heaven. They're going to burn incense to her. They're, they're going to they're going to follow the world, that is, and the wickedness of the world. Because then they feel they're free. But the Lord says, no, you're going to find out whose word's going to stand, yours or mine. But also in that, look at, look at number three under that, Chapter 44, the Lord promises a small number shall escape and return to Judah. There is the message right there. A small number. Only those that enter in by the straight gate. And that is completely misunderstood by most because they think it's entering into the acceptance of Jesus Christ as Savior. And once you do that, then you're set. It's not saying that. It says you enter in at the straight gate because narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. But wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that go in thereat. The Lord says here, a small number shall escape and return to Judah. That's the type also at that time of the rapture of the church or the remnant, the church. When I say church, I mean the true church, the true church that follows the word, the true church that is consistent in living the life, holding fast to the word of God without wavering. Amen. Walk in accordance to the vocation that you were called. Amen. So I'm going to read chapter 44. And chapter 45. Chapter 45 is only about five verses, really. 44 here says, The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt, which dwell at Migdal and at Tophanes and at Noph and at the and in the country of Pethro, saying, uh, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, ye have seen all. I'm going to back up because I want to comment on this. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt. In other words, they went to Egypt anyway. Even the Lord said, Don't go. You're going to die there. You're going to suffer there. But if you stay in the land, you'll be delivered. You can live. So then he, he says, all the Jews that went to Egypt that are dwelling in these various cities that are named here and communities, verse 2, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, you have seen all the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem. Remember, they're in bondage over in Babylon. And upon all the cities of Judah, 
They're all over there in Babylon. And behold, this day, they are a desolation and no man dwelleth therein. Speaking of these areas, Jerusalem and Judah. Verse three says, because of their wickedness. That's why they're in Babylon. Because of their wickedness, their refusal to follow the Lord, to follow his voice, to get into his word, to live his word. They believe only because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, ye, nor your fathers. Notice a small g, they're not gods at all. They're what people, things that people make gods. It could be idols. It could be anything. It could be anything that is cherished more than God himself or anything that is a pursuit of life other than God and his word. Verse four says, how be it I send unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them saying, oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. He did that, we read that also in the last chapter. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear to turn from their wickedness, to burn incense unto other gods. Wherefore, my fury and my, my anger was poured forth and was kindled in the cities of Judah, in the cities of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as at this day. Therefore, now this thus saith the Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel. Wherefore, meaning why? Wherefore commit ye this great evil against your souls? You're shooting yourself in the foot. What are you doing this for? You're the one that's going to suffer. Wherefore commit ye this great evil against your souls? to cut off from you man and woman, child and suckling out of Judah, to leave you none to remain, in that ye provoke me unto wrath with the works of your hands. Don't tell me that all you have to do is believe and it doesn't matter what you do. This couldn't be any plainer to refute that. You burn incense unto other gods in the land of Egypt, whither ye be gone to dwell, that you might cut yourselves off, that you might be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth, question mark, meaning why? Why are you doing this? Verse nine, have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers? and the wickedness of the kings of Judah, and the wickedness of their wives, and your own wickedness, and the wickedness of your wives, which they have committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Remember, I told you that's why they're in Babylon. That's why your, your fathers were under judgment also. They are not humbled even unto this day. Neither have they feared nor walked in my law. What's the law? It's the word of God, the voice of the Lord. Nor in my statutes, doing the word that I set before you and before your fathers. He's saying, I'm not telling you anything different than I told your fathers. They didn't do it, and now you're not doing it. Verse 11, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will set my face against you for evil and to cut off all Judah. 
That's what they didn't want to believe. The Lord says, you did these things and I have to do these things because I'm righteous. You're going to suffer. You're moving me against yourself. Why are you doing that? Verse 12. And I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, and they shall all be consumed. You know, this when it says remnant here, that's not talking about the remnant I was telling you about. The remnant, which is the church, is talking about all that are left. that have set their faces to go in the land of Egypt. It specifically names and describes them to sojourn there. You want to go there and live for a while, thinking you're going to be delivered there. You're going to escape the judgment that I told you if you went there. Why don't you stay in the land and live? Staying in the land that's, that's another type right there. Stay in the word. Stay in the word. Don't go anywhere else. Don't listen to any other voices. If you go into the land, you'll be consumed, it says, and fall in the land of Egypt. You'll be destroyed along with the rest of the world. They shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. Famine means the word of God. You don't take the word of God, you'll be destroyed by it. You're going to stumble by it. That's the way it is. Because the word of God is sharp. Like a two-edged sword. The word says it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It says they shall die from the least even unto the greatest by the sword and by the famine and they shall be an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. For I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So that none of the remnant of Judah, which are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, there again, it specifically describes them. None of them shall escape or remain that they should return into the land of Judah to the which they have a desire to return and to dwell there for none shall return but such as shall escape. There it shows the mercy, the loving kindness being exhibited right there by the Lord's judgment throne by himself from his heart. He leaves a way of escape for those who will turn to him and walk with him everywhere in the Bible. Verse 15, then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelled in the land of Egypt in Pathros answered Jeremiah saying, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. The flat out refusing the word. They say that's a false gospel. That's not true. That's not God saying that. Well, if they know what is God's word and what is not, why did they have to ask Jeremiah to seek the Lord for them to get the word? This is the, the goofiness of the carnal nature and the fallacy of it. 
verse 17, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth, forth out of our own mouth. We're not going to follow the word of God that comes out of his mouth. We're going to follow what comes out of our own mouth. Wow. That's just like Romans 1. They do not want to retain God or his word in their knowledge. They don't want to. They're going to follow their own ways and not God's ways. And it goes on to burn incense under the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. Completely blinded. They, they, they can't even see what's happening around them. They can see the judgment. They can see the, the things that are coming against them, but yet they can't see that all they have to do to stop that is to return to the Lord. And they think that they're doing well. In, in our United States of America now, Almost every minister I've heard on this subject declares that we are not under judgment. And yet, everything is corrupted today. Not only the government and all the agencies, our schools, but our churches. And we can't see that we're under judgment? May God give us eyes that see and ears that hear and a heart that believes. Verse 18. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings under her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. So they're saying, since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings under her, everything's going wrong. We're consumed by the sword and by the famine because they stumble at the word. They don't do it. They say they believe, but they don't do. And they say that we, we're just consumed by, they're stumbling by the word and they're blinded to it. They don't even know it because they refuse to keep God in their knowledge. God and his word. Verse 19, and when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? No. Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, all the people, the man of God now is going to speak, to the men, to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, the incense that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings, your princes, and your people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and came it not into his mind? Did you do it without God noticing it? Do you think that he didn't see this? Verse 22. So that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you have committed. There comes a time when the Lord will bring forth that which he has said, which is not going to be going to Babylon for 70 years. It's going to be for eternity without God in a lake of fire. 
because of the abominations which ye have committed. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day because you burned incense and because you have sinned against the Lord. All capitals there, the Lord, that means the Lord Jesus Christ. And have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, the word of God, Jesus the Christ, nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies. All of this is you didn't follow the word. Therefore, this evil is happened unto you as at this day. That's the cause of the judgment. That's the cause of the trouble. Verse 24, moreover, Jeremiah said unto them, the people, unto all the people, and to all the women, hear the word of the Lord. All Judah that are in the land of Egypt, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. He's the God of everyone, but he's the God, definitely the God of Israel saying, ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hand, saying, we will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your, perform your vows. You're going to do exactly what you said. Verse 26, Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord. This is saying, heads up, listen. All Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt, behold, that's another heads up, Look, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah than all the land of Egypt. He, he doesn't want to even hear it. Even if they begin to speak it, he's, he's come to the end. This is the end. Verse 27, behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good, and all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. This is, this is speaking to that situa situation there, but it's also Speaking to us today, Egypt is a form of the world, is a type of the world. To all the men of Judah is a type of those that claim to have Jesus Christ as their Savior. But they will be consumed by the sword and by the famine. And again, a spiritual famine, meaning the word of God, because they will not seek it. They look for it, maybe, but they can't find it because they refuse to take it when it's spoken to them. They refuse it. They say they're going to go their own way. They're going to decide who's saying God's word and who isn't until there be an end of them. And then the promise, praise God. Yet a small number, emphasis small number, few there be that find it. A small number that escape the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah. There again, that's a type. A small number, that means a remnant. They're going to escape the sword because they're going to return to the land 
uh, out of the land of Egypt and go into the land of Judah, which means going back into the rest that God promised. This is a shadow and a type of the end time. But it's speaking only of those who are termed the remnant, the faithful ones, the one that recognize that the word of God is necessary and they seek and follow the Lord and another voice they will not follow. And all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose words shall stand mine or theirs. Then you're going to know whose word is going to stand. You're going to be well off by following what you wanted. Or you're going to understand that the only way you could be delivered is to follow me and do my words. Everybody's going to everybody's going to know whose word is going to stand at the end. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Verse 29, and this shall be a sign unto you, saith the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my word shall surely stand against you for evil. So he's saying, I'm not taking you to Babylon. I've done that. I'm going to punish you right where you are. You've chosen that place. There you're going to be consumed. Right there. Verse 30. Thus saith the Lord, behold, there again, a double emphasis, a heads up. I will give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies and into the hand of them that seek his life, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy, and that sought his life. You get the same result, you're going to be destroyed by your enemies. Your enemy is the devil. Your enemy is the word. Uh, excuse me, the world. The word is your deliverer. The world is your enemy. Don't go to the world. Don't follow the world. Go to the word. God, the word of God. Chapter 45, verse 1. The word that Jeremiah, the prophet, spake into Barak, the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book at the mouth of Jeremiah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, this is a promise now, Go to the notes for just a minute. This is instruction to those that are called. This barrack here is a scribe of Jeremiah, a, a scribe of the Lord, a scribe, writing God's word at, as Jeremiah gives it. He's one of the faithful ones. He's the one that sees the word and understands the word. So chapter 45 is going to give instruction to him and also give resolve to those that are faithful. Let's go finish it. So the Lord wants Jeremiah to speak unto Barak. and describes him as the one that has written the word that Jeremiah spoke. Verse two, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Barak. So you see, it's specifically to the faithful one, the one that has the word, the one that's been involved in the word. Verse three, thou didst say, woe is me now, 
for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. He's saying, this is the description of a faithful one who knows the word that sees that the, there's no there's there's no deliverance in sight that the Lord is going to bring a swift judgment on the world and destroy it. And he's wondering oh, what's going to happen. He's discouraged because nothing's going to turn out like the preacher said, where everything is going to work out fine if you follow the word. You're not going to be going into judgment. Is that right? Then why, even though Jeremiah was delivered for the purpose of continuing to prophesy to every Jewish person that was left in the land of Judah, but Ezekiel was over there in Babylon. Not only in Babylon, he was right there in the, in the slave camp. The prophet of the Lord. Because a life of sacrifice is a part of the gospel. Jeremiah had to go back, even though he chose it as led of the Lord, and continue to prophesy to a gainsaying people, who were a rebellious people who refused to accept the word. That's the judgment. That's a sacrifice. Every bit of this is the gospel. I hope you can see it. Verse four, thus shalt thou say unto him, the Lord saith thus, behold, that which I have, the Lord says, that which I have built will I break down. That which I have planted, I will pluck up. Even this whole land. The Lord saying, I said that I was going to tear down Judah and I will. My word will not fail. It will perform that which I send it. Verse 5. And seekest thou great things for thyself? You think there's another way out, Barak? You think you can escape this? There's another way to follow the Lord? Seek them not. Don't go that way, Barak. For behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. But the promise to the faithful, thy life will I give unto thee for a prey in all places whither thou goest. You know what that's saying? Thy life will be given unto thee for a prey. That means victory. That no matter where you go, you'll be successful in me. No matter what trial or skirmish or, or threat or torture or anything you will go through, you will be victorious in all things wherever you go if you're faithful. I'm going to bring destruction to the world, but thy life will I give thee for a prey in all places whither thou goest. That's a promise to the remnant, the faithful ones, the one who recognizes the need, the need to continue in the word. What was Barak's vocation? He was in the word. And he was publishing the word. That was his vocation, you might say. Praise the Lord. So as I said, this, this is the type of the rapture, the rapture before the judgment comes. Now, here we'll, uh, well, I want to bring you the verses in the New Testament that bring the instruction to the call. 
all those that are in the word and following the word. Jesus had been crucified and he arose this day. And John chapter 20, verse 19, that same day, it says, then that same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. You know what this is saying? This is saying, the Lord is calling you to peace, spiritual peace. And he's saying, if you'll just recognize this, I will reveal myself to you. They didn't know it was Jesus until he showed them his hands. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. What did they see in his hands? They saw the marks of the nails that were driven through his hands. When they saw the Lord, they were glad. They rejoiced. Verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. There's the instruction to the faithful. These disciples were the faithful ones that followed him. The one that was not faithful was destroyed. That was Judas Iscariot. The message again, the fullness of the gospel again. But those who follow the Lord, he says, peace be unto you. There's nothing like the peace of God and knowing that you are in God's peace. Because you believe his word, you know his word is true. Barak knew the word was true. That's why he was dismayed. He knew that it was going to happen. But the Lord encouraged Barak and says, don't go that way looking for something else. Don't look for something else besides this. The world has got to go into judgment. But you, I'm going to spare you. Your life is going to be given to you as a prey no matter where you go. You will be victorious wherever you go. If you're faithful, continue to be faithful. Hold fast to the profession of your faith without wavering. For God is faithful. So the Lord is saying to you, I wonder, you know, I've spoken this message here for years. And we in this ministry continue to bring this this very thought and commission to instruct in our Bible studies and our messages frequently that God is calling everyone, not just a few that feel like they'd go like to go in the, into the missionary field or to be a pastor of a church or whatever. You know, the Lord is commissioning everyone who follows him. Look at the example of him in this situation right here. He had just risen from the dead, and he's going to spend 40 days revealing himself to about 500 people giving them all the same message concerning things concerning the kingdom of God and telling them all, peace be unto you as my father has sent me, even so send I you. But he's going to go on to say, but don't go anywhere yet. Go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the father. When the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, unto Samaria, Judea, and other parts of the world. 
Many don't receive that. They think that that's only for a few. No. The same message was given to everyone. But out of the 500 that the Lord gave that message to, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, only 120 showed up to stay in Jerusalem, to be faithful, to follow what the Lord said. And how many of them were baptized in the Holy Spirit at that day? Every one of them. And every one of them received that commission and began to spread the word of God, even in other languages. See, that's the message. That's If we just look at the words that are printed rather than what it's saying, we miss the very call of God. The, the Lord wants every one of his followers to be on the same page, to use a popular expression, to have the same mind, to have the same zeal, to have the same love for him and his word and the people. Verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. There is their deliverance right there, but that's not the baptism. They received the baptism 40 days later, 50 days later, excuse me. After Jesus rose after 40 days, they waited 10 days in Jerusalem when the day of Pentecost was fully come, 50 days after the Passover. And the Lord says in verse 23, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted and unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. That's also misunderstood, people thinking that that's saying, you can be a savior, save some and lose some. No, it isn't saying that at all. It's saying, you give the word, some will receive and some won't. You just give the word. You be faithful to stand by the word and give the word. You give the word to the people in your sphere of influence, the place where God has called you to be, a light in the darkness. You may not be in Samaria or Judea, but you are in the uttermost parts of the world, every one of you. Every one of us are someplace in this world. And if we have received Christ and his mighty baptism, we are to be a, an influence in this area, in this, that area to bring forth the complete word of God that people may be delivered. We pray for our communities. We pray for our country. We pray for our state, we pray for our people. And the answer is that we give the word. Some will receive and some won't. And those who receive, you'll get the blessing of seeing them delivered. You'll see them in glory. You're being used of God. God is doing, gonna do the work, but you speak the word and he does the work. You plant and water, but God gives the increase. You don't save anybody, but you can save the world by giving forth the word of God and being committed to go all the way to the very end. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord for his mercy his love, his truth, his faithfulness. 
Now here's a revolve to the resolve, excuse me, to or of the people who take that advice and and take the word of God right here. Romans chapter one, beginning with 14. Again, as I say, uh, given this message like this over the years, and I wonder how many really receive it. Do they just think, of, oh, that's another great message. Oh, praise the Lord. That's the word of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. But do they really get what it's saying in regards to themselves and where they fit into this instruction. Well, it's no secret, it's the word of God here that Paul was definitely commissioned by the Lord, but why was he? Because he was proven to be fully committed to the Lord before he ever knew him. He thought he was doing God's will by, by destroying Christians and he was day and night into the word of God that he could claim by the law he was blameless. Another example of the faithful. So the Lord Jesus saw how faithful he was and he called him on the road to Damascus. Called him himself personally. Gave him that experience of falling off of his horse and blinding himself because, blinding him rather, so they could get his attention and then gave him the instruction to go just like the other disciples into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So in Romans, this is Paul again saying in verse 14, chapter one, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. That means to, to those that are faithful and those that are not, to those that are smart about it, those that are wise, and those who aren't. I'm a debtor. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome, at Rome also. Take that to heart, beloved. This is saying it to you and to me and to every child of God. As much as in you is, by receiving Christ, walking in his word, and being baptized by his Holy Spirit, you need to be ready to spread this gospel. Whether it's by by uh, just visiting with those whom you know or meet, or whether it's holding services or holding Bible studies, you will graduate into teaching the word of God because that call is there on you. When you receive that mighty baptism of the Holy Ghost, you receive that call. You receive that power. You don't need to worry about the words as much as you is in, meaning the words that you speak. In other words, feeling that you don't know how to speak it. You don't know how to do anything. Just tell people about Jesus. Stay in his word and you will. Begin to speak as the oracles of God and God will bless you to influence people to receive him and to walk in him, which is the most critical point of that gospel, to receive the end result. Verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That means to everybody. It was to be brought to the Jew first. Well, it was brought to Paul first. In this situation, 
And now he's to spread it to the rest of the world the way God planned from the beginning. That's why it chose Abraham. It chose Abraham because he knew that Abraham would teach the word to his people, which he did because he followed what God said. Praise the Lord. Oh, this is a powerful message, a needful message. All right. All shall know whose word shall stand. That was the title. The Jews said here in verse four, uh, chapter 44, verses 15 to 19, they said, Then all the men which knew their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even of all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, and Pathros answered Jeremiah, saying, this is talking about a great many people. All of them. They said, as for, for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. Obstinate, rebellious. But we will, vowing to do whatever they wanted to do. We will certainly do whatever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven, to pour out the drink of offerings unto her. So we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off the burning incense to the queen of heaven and to the pour out drink offering unto her, we have wandered all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the fat. So, speaking to or they, the ones that heard the word, refused it. You know what? Jesus suffered that. There's only a few people that really accepted the word and followed him. Actually, only 11 people, isn't it? At the time he was ministering, although he ministered to many and many people heard and really followed until he said that they had to drink his blood and eat his flesh, not understanding they left him and didn't walk with him anymore. They didn't want to go through to find out what that was all about or to seek the Lord. Even though they saw his miraculous deeds and heard his wonderful words. And that's the way it is today. That is the way it is to every minister, including me and mine here at the, at the Lighthouse Ranch, that any of us who preach this full gospel are rejected by the majority, including church. Because we insist on bringing only the word of God, speaking in terms of Bibles, the King James Bible is the one that's proven to be the preserved word of God. We say that, but is anybody checking it out? But many are refusing that statement and they're, they're rebellious in that area and refuse because they love the version they have, which is a perversion. It's not the word of God. When you think about that, it makes you cringe. Why would we want anything than the authentic word of God, the truth? And so they get a, a watered down a message no matter how sincere they are, they don't get the full message. 
They're in danger of misunderstanding God's powerful word. Where are the people that are receiving this message? Where are the ones that say, yea and amen, I'm here, I'm ready. As much as in me is, I'm going to take this message to everybody I know. Why? Because the Lord said to, and I love the Lord and I love his word and I love the people. But many just shake the pastor's hand and say, great message, pastor, and go on their way seeking their own desires, not seeking the Lord, feeling they're perfectly safe because they've accepted the Lord, but don't get involved in the doing of it. Jesus said, as the Father has called me, sent me, so send I you. Every one of you who have received that mighty baptism after receiving Christ are called. Make that resolve to as much as in you now, you're ready to spread this word to the masses. God said in Jeremiah chapter 44, Verse 28, 4 to 28. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and to the women and the word had heard the word, the Lord rather, and all Judah that are in the land of Egypt, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your heart. And saying, we will surely perform our vows that we have vowed and to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord. All Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt, behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying the Lord God liveth. They're doing that today, but it's not the truth. The truth isn't spoken. This is coming to pass right in front of our eyes. We experience it in our churches. They do not speak the fullness of the gospel. They do not speak about the need to be spotless in order to enter the rapture and to the kingdom, love ultimately the kingdom, the rest of God. They don't warn of the tribulation period or the judgment that is coming when all must face the judgment seat of Christ and the ultimate great white throne judgment at the end of the kingdom time. Thousand year reign of Christ. Verse 27 says, Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good and all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine and there until there be an end of them. That's what the Lord said. Yet, a small number that escaped the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt, out of the world, into the land of Judah, into the promise of the kingdom, the rest of the Lord, and all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt. That's not the remnant we've been talking about. That's the rest of Judah that do not return. They're not a part of the small number they're gone into the land of Egypt to the sojourner. Sojourners shall know. They're going to know whose word shall stand. Mine or theirs, of course. God's word will stand. 
So the sign. The Lord says it will be a sign. And it's in verse 29 and 30. This shall be a sign unto you, saith the Lord, that I will punish you in this place. Where are you standing? Is your place under judgment in this world? Are you experiencing the corruption and the evils of this world happening right there in your own area? And this shall be a sign unto you, saith the Lord, that I will punish you in this place that you may know that my word shall surely stand against you in this evil. Well, in this scenario here, in this example, the people were in Egypt and he says, I'm going to punish you right here. I, I sent everyone else into Babylon, but I'm going to punish you right here where you are. This is where you chose to be. This is where I will punish you. Verse 30, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will give Pharaoh, Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies and into the hand of them that seek his life as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy that sought his life. The forces of the enemy are out to destroy you, a child of God. One that has received Christ and sought him for his mighty baptism in the spirit. The enemy is out to silence you so that you don't say anything, but to console you and pacify you by telling you that all you have to do is believe and that's all that is required. Don't pay any mind to the things that the word says about the doing of it. Just believe. And don't worry about the version of the Bible that you use. If one doesn't, if one doesn't fit what you like, just pick another one. How ridiculous. I actually heard a pastor say that. If you don't like one, just pick another one. How could a minister say such a thing? So, so shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the thing which I shall send it. I want to finish here with that. Isaiah 55, two verses. Isaiah gave this message by the mighty Holy Ghost of God. Speaking for God, he says, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh, maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. The Lord's word is going forth from those that are faithful, and it will accomplish that which he sent it. It will bring blessing to those who follow, accept and live that life. It'll bring righteousness to them and they will manifest that righteousness that God has given us. They will live that righteous life that God has given us through Christ here on earth and they will escape the judgment that comes upon those who do not follow the word of God. The Lord does those things constantly in the earth and he delights in them. 
take this message to heart. Dear child of God, hear the message. Go beyond the message of the history of the Jewish people and the mistakes they made. See the purpose that God put him in his word, that they would be examples for us in the end time, that we should not make the same mistakes that they made, but that we should hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So remember the message that you're not only to believe, but you are to live it and you are to spread it. The word must go forth. It shall not return void, but it shall accomplish that which he sent it to do. He sent it forth to deliver the, those who would follow and to destroy those who will not. And it shall perform that which he sent it to do. God bless you, and I appreciate every one of you that stay with us in these actually Bible study messages and that accept them and put them into practice just as God wants. God love you, bless you, and keep you safe from all harm and meet your every need. In the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, my Lord and Savior. God bless you. Amen.